Let's start this session. Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome back after this intense political talks. We go back to more research related uh, discussions here in this session around remote sensing and the question about a new era approaching that we will discuss here. Um, my name is Franz Simmer. I work at the European Commission in the, um, in the Department for Research and Innovation. I'm dealing there uh, with environmental observations. So we fund research projects, a lot of which have been mentioned here in the last two days in the various sessions. Um, and generally we fund all sorts of research organizations and public, uh, more the public side of things. Um, and probably the private sector is present, but maybe not enough. So I'm very happy that we have this discussion, which is really addressing this question, how the private sector is involved or can be involved and can better be involved in research activities in the Arctic. And particularly, we have the look from space, so from the satellites side of things. Um, so uh, let's start. We have a very nice panel of experts here, partly private sector, partly researchers. Um, and I would like to start with the private sector. And we have here Nina Soleng. He's, she's head of the communication at Kongsat Satellite Services in Troms in Norway, where you live, in the Arctic. Um, and uh, as I said, we talk about the new era in KSAT. Um, so I heard your company has been making quite a development, have been thriving in the last year. So we maybe you can enlighten us what, from your perspective, the new era looks like. Yes, thank you, Franz. Yeah, so KSAT, uh, as you said, located in the north. Uh, we are the world's largest provider of space to ground services. So that basically means uh, we talk to and take care of uh, the satellites in orbit and then make sure that the valuable data gets down to where it needs to be in a timely and secure manner, where it can come to good use, as we uh, have heard over the days. Uh, so we have a global network of, um, of 28 ground stations around the world, but we have a significant presence uh, in the Arctic, with the world's largest uh, ground station for data reception up at Svalbard at 78 degrees north. Uh, 50 employees are headquarters in Tromsø uh, in uh, 69 degrees north with 300 staff. When I started in 2008, we were 70 people. Now we are over 450. So it's been a, a huge uh, growth for us. Uh, we also provide EO services. I don't have to go into all of that, but we have an extensive portfolio of satellites. Uh, we provide uh, acute pollution information, vessel detection, um, where we monitor the, the Norwegian continental shelf every day for preparedness response all of European uh, waterways for the EO member states, uh, for EMSA, as well as customers in the uh, Middle East and Australia. So you said that the new era for us is, is, I can sum up maybe with one word, it's more, more of everything. Uh, our huge growth has been uh, because of the launch of so many new uh, commercial satellites uh, in addition to the national space programs. Actually, in the next 10 years, uh, it's planned to be launched as many satellites as has been launched in the previous 60 uh, years. So this means more of the same. It means more of high-resolution optical. SAR means better revisit times. You know, we can have more frequent updates. Uh, it means improved sensors, which gives us, you know, higher resolution, better accuracy, and new sensors, and that's also been something that's been mentioned here. Looking at uh, specifically the Arctic with methane, with carbon emissions, you know, new missions have been, uh, have been launched uh, now, focusing on that, getting better. So we can have new, uh, new services uh, with new sensors. Um, also navigation, radar detection also gives us more insight. So a lot of uh, opportunities for us. Uh, for you, <laughs> a lot of challenging challenges for us because we need to scale. Uh, we have so much uh, traffic, so much huge data volumes, so we need to scale. We need to scale the operation, we need to scale the ground segment, we need to scale our analytics uh, capabilities. So it's all about digitalization and automatic processes and AI and cloud <laughs> for us. 
Thanks, Nina. Um, let's move on to our next panelist. We will discuss these things. I think there are very interesting aspects in there that we will discuss later. Let's move on to Annika. Annika Hook, she worked, uh, she is working at planet.com. Is that planet? planet? Simply planet, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, during her career, she worked at different places, uh, combining private, public, and research experience. So after graduating in Earth Observation, she joined the European Space Agency in 2012. And she was also working in the European Commission, which why I know you quite well, because we were kind of colleagues at that time. And since from 2018 to 2020, sorry, and then since 2020, you work at Planet. And so, which probably you can tell us what Planet is, for those who don't know, and what, from your perspective, is the new era or the new space era. Thank you so much, Franz, for the kind introduction, and thank you so much for having me here today. Maybe I will start with a little anecdote which actually related to polar research. I was one of the very, very lucky students that was sent to the Ar uh, Antarctica 2007-8 during the last international polar year. And you can imagine I was really struck by the beauty of this really fragile environment. And I remember there was a part of King George Island where I have been based for a couple of months, which was untouched more or less by the humans because it was under protection since the 1970s already. But looking at, at it, you could still see the imprints of actually car tires on the moss. And it was really incredible to see how long it actually takes there in such a fragile environment for the nature to recover from human impact. And this really changed my perspective on how to understand changes over time in such an environment. And I would say new space or new space era for me is the same in a way that it helps us to change perspective. It provides us insights into the past to predict the future much better than we could before. So as mentioned before by my colleague, we now actually can build on an archive, on an heritage missions from the public sector as well from the private companies. Planet, for example, is, the, is a private company, um, US-based, and we are currently maintaining the largest Earth observation fleet in the world. But we are actually having this massive archive, which we're contributing also today to huge um, European, uh, to the huge European endeavor of Copernicus program, and as well as to Horizon Europe. And it's really essential for us to make sure we're bringing all these efforts together in this new era. So, as mentioned also before, not only the wealth of this immense amount of data, which is really has been unprecedented before, we need um, not only AI to actually extract information and also um, the um, uh, processing capabilities in Europe. So we are also co discussing with our colleagues how can we contribute, for example, to the generation of the digital twin, eventually also digital twin of the Arctic region. Um, most also for me, it's an era where really we need to see that we all contribute and we are pulling all the information, all the, the efforts together under the stewardship of international but also particular European environmental regulations and national research agendas. Thanks for this comprehensive overview and for the suggestion to bring things together, which is what we're going to discuss. And we, we turn now a bit from the supply side to the demand side, but, but stay within the private sector and come back. I know that Annika lives, lives in Rome, so we come back to Tromsø. I think you're, you're located in Tromsø as well with um, the Arctic Economic Council, of which you are the executive director. And um, so the question for you is hearing about this new era um, <clears throat> um, and I learned you talked about the satellites, all these satellites we heard, uh, heard about is for the Arctic is a kinder egg. You know, these little chocolate eggs that have toys inside. Um, can you explain what you mean with that? Thank you. Um, yes, I like to call it the kinder egg because as we all know as kids, the kinder egg is this thing that has three, thing, three things in once. But, uh, but before I mention why I think it is a kind egg, I just want to say, when you buy a house, you, what you look for is location, location, location. And here, the Arctic plays a key role. There's a reason why we heard about Svalbard. There's a reason why that's a good place to receive all the data from the satellites. There's also a reason why 
If you look to Sweden, Norway, and the, the space ports, the launch stations for the satellites also takes place very high up north, because it's a vast area where there is a lot of space around as well. Um, even in Greenland right now, they're talking about space ports. So when it comes to location, 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 the Arctic is perfect for satellites. Um, and now when we talk about the Kinder Egg, the reason is for, and we will hear from the next two speakers, from, from the research area. You know, obviously you can use satellites for permafrost, for studying wildfires, uh, remote sensing, and so on. So a lot of researchers see a potential, obviously, in using satellite data for that. So that's the first part of the Kindake. The second, and we will hear more about that for the next two speakers. The next part is, um, and, and actually I want to mention one more case, which is actually with Planet, that uh, because of Planet satellites, they discovered the um, environmental damage that was done around Nor Norilsk Nickel in Russia, where there were some leaks of, of oil from, uh, from uh, going into the river, and that was discovered with these low Earth orbiting satellites on Planet. Um, and together with artificial intelligence. The second one is government or defense mainly here. So if you look at the US Space Force, when they were created, they said specifically that they would invest in satellites to get better weather monitoring. So it becomes critical for the defense sector to have better uh, weather monitoring. So the US Space Force says, no, in the Arctic, we need more satellites. Also, when it comes to secure communication, like satellites is critical infrastructure. When you cannot communicate with subsea fiber optic cables, you can use satellites. And then comes the third part of the, of where, of the Kindake, and where I think the magic of the satellites in the Arctic is. There's, because distances are so large, and there's also a lot of uncertainty, you can use it for sea ice prediction. So for example, KSAT is working with Hurti Roten on helping this to plan the, sh the sailing routes in the future. You can use it for oil spill response. You can use it for search and rescue. You can use it for fishery control. So it just shows that when you put up, we heard there a lot more, there will be a lot more in space. It will have an impact. It will have an impact for climate researchers. It will have an impact on our security and defense and governments. And it will have an impact on how we do business for cruise ships and oil, uh, oil spills, etc. And that's why I called it the Kindake. Thank you. Thank you, Mats. Uh, let's now move to the research side. So after hearing from the private sector, so we have Ashley Morris here. Uh, he's a remote sensing officer at SIOS, the Svalbard Integrated Arctic uh, Earth Observing System, um, which is a consortium, an international consortium of universities and research institutes conducting earth system science research in and around Svalbard, so the Norwegian archipelago uh, in the high Arctic. And he has a background in glaciology and used data from various satellites, including optical, SAR, altimetry, and, to and so on, to study glaciers in the Arctic. So from your point of view, what do you think the new era you heard about, what does it bring, and do you already feel it coming? Um, I think it's possible to look at the sort of half century we've had of, remote, of Earth observation <clears throat> as a time of uh, gradual change, so with each a uh, new satellite will have some improvement in technology, so there'll be higher resolution or larger areas covered or some yeah, um, new wavelength band or something that will improve our ability to, um, to observe the Earth. Um, but I think this misses what's happened. But, this, but seeing this as a gradual change misses what's happened in the last 10 years or so. Uh, when I look back, that's what I would probably define as this, this new era to me. Uh, when I look back at, at the time since I started my PhD um, 14 years ago, uh, when I thought about what's changed in that time, I think that the thing that I thought of immediately was the Copernicus program. So this constellation of Sentinel satellites with um, various instruments for various Earth, Earth observation applications. And I think what's novel about the Copernicus program compared to perhaps earlier satellite, Earth observation satellites, was that the idea that this needed to be a continuous thing, that, that um, we needed um, continuous, intercomparable um, satellite data for the, over the long term, um, was really, uh, maybe revolutionary is too strong a word, but that's uh, a huge advantage to scientists working in Earth observation, because the changes we're looking at, although some changes in the Arctic are happening very quickly, uh, we need to look over the long term to make sure that we're seeing you know, emerging signals, not just kind of weather and climate, you know, we've, um, various uh, panels will have discussed this sort of thing. 
uh, in the last couple of days. And then I thought also um, the increasing openness of science is something um, that's, that's new in, in, or has evolved in, in that time frame. And I mean that at all levels. So um, when I first was obtaining Earth observation data from space agencies, I had to write a proposal about what I was going to do with the data, and sometimes I'd have to wait for uh, CD-ROMs to arrive in the post, which seems ancient these days, where now the space agencies have these amazing portals where you can look at data and, and in a lot of cases, download it straight away, and sometimes maybe you have to wait for it to be processed, and you can download it straight to your, your laptop or your um, desktop computer the next day, and you know, that just, just speeds things up. Um, also, the push towards fair, uh, fair data and open data. And I think that also um, brings me on to another point that I think has, has changed quite considerably or improved quite considerably over the last 10 years or so is the availability of high-level products derived from remote sensing. So not just publishing a paper where you've done a certain um, technique in a certain area and found a certain thing, but um, uh, so if I take an example from glaciology, uh, maps of glacier velocity um, from optical or SAR satellites, uh, maps of glacier thinning from altimetry satellites that, that, like I say, don't relate to a particular paper, but are just put out there by, by the, the community and, and are available for anyone to use, that sort of lowers the bars to entry to using remote sensing for, study, for Earth observation, and also frees up time to be working on kind of deeper insights rather than just data processing. Um, whilst we talk about data processing, I should also mention um, artificial intelligence and machine learning that seem to be uh, very much coming to the fore recently in, in um, Earth observation data processing. And finally, I should mention um, high resolution uh, commercial satellite data such as Planet that, um, yeah, that, that, that's, can't, that resolution can't be matched by uh, the space agency satellites and just gives us an, an extra uh, data set that, that can allow us to do some science that we can't do without that really high resolution. Thank you very much, Ashley. Um, let's just complete the panel and we have Guido here, fortunately. Guido Grosse from Alfred Wegener Institute where he is the head of the permafrost research section in, I think, in Potsdam, right? Um, so for permafrost research, um, we have discussed in the previous panels the uh, problems with Russia, and uh, which is indeed for permafrost research creates a huge gap in data. Um, probably can elaborate on how the opportunities we've heard about the new satellite systems that come in place, the amazing new, new amounts of satellite systems from the private sector, but of course also Copernicus and other public systems can help filling this gap. Yeah, so for permafrost, it's, it's very challenging. It's the one component of the cryosphere that is actually a subsurface phenomenon, and uh, it doesn't consist of ice, like ice sheets, sea ice, snow, and glaciers, which we can see at the surface. So we have challenges with remote sensing in general. We use remote sensing quite extensively, though, um, because we can use uh, satellite data or airborne data to monitor surface characteristics, land surface temperature, land cover, other things that relate to permafrost temperature. So we can indirectly monitor permafrost, but we can also monitor permafrost thaw, where we see erosion or changes in lakes, lake erosion, lake drainage, that we can relate to permafrost processes at the surface. So when I started my PhD, and that's very similar to what Ashley already said, um, it's about 20 years ago for me, I was able to purchase six Landsat scenes for $600 each. And that was sent on uh, compact disks, and that was the, the data I was working with in my, my thesis project. So the new area era we, we are facing now is a totally different uh, world, basically. So that's ancient, that's alien, this concept of working with very few data. Um, it allows us to work across the Arctic, not just at individual sites, uh, very few field sites, um, where we had to yeah, select, hand-selected data, basically, but now with the different types of, of sensors, of constellations, of different missions, um, that allows us to have lots of optical data, lots of SAR data. Um, it really enables us to look at the entire Arctic, which is actually necessary, because the changes in the Arctic 
are very diverse. If you look at permafrost regions, we developed a tool called the Alex tool in the Arctic Passion Project, the Arctic Landscape Explorer, that allows people to look at uh, land surface changes. It's a website, basically. And uh, what we notice is it's not a static landscape. It's a landscape that is really affected by fires, by erosion, by lake change, by, by other processes, river change. And so, yeah, a few images are popping up here in the background. These are actually thermocarst lakes, lakes that thaw the permafrost in Siberia. And so this, the big challenge in this new era that we have also as domain scientists, I consider myself a domain scientist for permafrost or for, for the cryosphere, um, is how do we deal with that large amount of data in increasingly volumes, increasing velocities, increasing re resolutions. So it's not just spatial resolution, it's also the temporal resolution. Uh, so Planet delivers daily data um, at three meter resolution, um, but also the, the, the Sentinel um, missions have very high resolution in the Arctic because of the swath overlap there. So it involves new approaches, basically. We have heard the terms machine learning, AI. That's really important, becoming uh, also for us as, as domain scientists. So we have to work together with computer scientists, with data scientists, to actually analyze, process, handle that large amount of data, and then also visualize it. So it's not just enough to um, process the data, but making sense of this large amount of data and getting a visualization that helps not just us as a scientist, but also the, the public to understand what the changes are, that's really crucial, and that's the new era, I think. Thank you very much. Before I open uh, also the floor for, to the audience to ask questions around these interesting aspects that you mentioned, maybe I would go back to the supply side, and after you heard what you know, obviously, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity and the researchers are using the data, but from your perspective, how can, how can the, the, the data you supply facilitate and address the, facilitate the work of the researchers and address the challenges imposed to, by climate change? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what was mentioned here, the satellites are quite unique, that uh, they provide objective information uh, from space, and we have time series uh, going back to to the 80s, uh, and I'm, you know, and we, we have those follow-on missions uh, in, in focus now. So just one example when it comes to climate change and um, and sustainability, just to show how critical uh, satellite-based information is, is that there are 54 essential climate variables. Uh, identified by the Global Climate Observing System. Um, and uh, from UN's Outer Space Office, uh, they said in a presentation that m over 30 of them can only be monitored and measured by satellite. So just to give you a perspective how, how, how uh, central uh, it is. So, um, but then when it comes to the Arctic, there's, you know, th there's uh, special conditions. You said it's very diverse, uh, it's different challenges. But also, I mean, I live in Tromsø in the Arctic. Uh, from November to January, there's no sun. In Svalbard, it's four months of dark. Uh, we have a lot of clouds, we have a lot of weather, you know, so we don't really have optical weather all the time. You know, so, so, so this going forward, knowing your sensors and, and applying the right satellites and the right uh, sensors to the right task at the right time of the year, I think this is very important going forward to have that sensor diversity and have the knowledge. And from our side, we can also advise, you know, uh, how to best use a combination uh, of satellite data. Thanks. Annika, how can private sector data facilitate the research work from your perspective? I think also coming back to the discussion we had this morning, where there was still discussion or question around data access and actually should we share data. And I don't think this is really the question anymore because I consider data as a public good. And I really we should work with the scientific community at the best possible ways to really extract knowledge from it and to rather think about, you know, how do we maintain this knowledge? And I think this is rather the crucial question here. We personally as Planet, um, to give you a few examples, we contribute to the ESA EarthNet program where we make sure you know, the data is actually available to the scientific community. We contribute to the Copernicus program. Um, yet again, to really make sure the data 
is available at a larger scale possible. We're also collaborating with national member states like um, the Norwegian on the so-called NICFI program, where we actually provide our entire archive to the um, national research programs on tropical forests, and we would actually like to repeat the same for the Arctic regions. So there's a lot of possibilities possibilities to really going on to bring this data and really insert them into, again, the European and national research agendas. But then there's, sorry, and then there's the financial model, you know, because you need to fund it. So uh, we say, okay, so the commercial and private uh, sector can really complement, you know, uh, the larger institutional programs like Copernicus and everything, because it's all paid for, you know, or it all costs money. You have to pay for it. Uh, okay, so for, for Copernicus, the countries have paid up front. Um, and for NICFI, Norway, uh, the government of Norway is paying for it. Uh, you know, now going forward, um, Jeff Bezos Foundation pledged that they will con start to, to fund it uh, on, the, on the next phase. So, I mean, it's, it's, we need to find the funding, and like you say, it's a very successful model that we see with the NICFI satellite, uh, the Tropical Data Program is a public-private initiative, and I think that's a very good idea going forward, a good model um, to how to, to, to buy data and to make it available. Matt, why is satellite data so important for the private sector, and maybe you can also elaborate a bit how can the private sector also support the research work? We heard about these challenges that we have uh, to address climate change, uh, the, the, the challenges we have in the Arctic for, for the communities and so on. But, and I think it goes both ways. I mean, without the research of climate research, I mean, it's impossible to predict, you know, if you want to do any investments in whatever sector, you need to know about how the world is going to look in the future. You need to know about permafrost, else you don't do investments in big parts of the Arctic. Um, so it goes both ways. And, and I just want to link it with, with what Nina said about the investments, because that's also why we need to work together. Because technology moves extremely fast, uh, also within this sector. And if we look, I mean, I'm sure you all know about Starlink and what they have done in a very short time, uh, or SpaceX for that matter. But you look how the private sector is moving very, very fast. But at the same time, especially in the Arctic, economy of scale is a challenge. We have 4 million people uh, across the Arctic region. So you need these large programs. I mean, this is where the magic of the EU comes in and can do these kind of things that they can help fund something together with the private sector that then helps develop the technology and, and make sure that it's com competitive and cutting edge. And then the research is contributing, which says, how can we use artificial intelligence, machine learning? Uh, how can we make best, best use of the data? So there needs to be this constant conversation between the, the, the donor or the funders, uh, the customers, so to say, and the technology providers. Um, so, so yes, the private sector um, need satellites, but they definitely also need the dialogue and the investments because, as we heard, nothing comes for free. Thanks. You want to add something? Maybe one, one comment to add here. So, I mean, there, there is from the European Commission and ESA basically the Copernicus program, which provides uh, open satellite data already to a large extent for different types of satellites and missions and sensors. So that is very useful. So I, I see both things as complementary. So they are not competing, in my view. Um, because they deliver different aspects of data and yeah, data streams, basically, that would be very valuable, not just for research, but also maybe for investments in economy in the Arctic, but also for safety and hazard detection, things like that. So I think they are complementary. That's uh, the message I wanted to say. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, what do you see as a challenge from the research side? To I mean, you mentioned we have a lot of data, Copernicus, certainly also a game changer in providing huge amounts of data and services also to researchers, but also to a wider range of people. Um, but in terms of using the data or having access to the data, linking satellite with in-situ data and, and to get really the insights you need, what do you see as the challenges that we still need also me as funding agency, you mentioned it, should, should address? Yeah, I think one, one of the challenges also, um, I mean, we are not downloading data anymore at the scale that we did in the past, but we are moving to a, to a model where well, code is moved where the data is, basically. So into the cloud, for example. And data is processed there, and then we get the information back, the, the finished data product. 
Um, and so this is yeah, also a shift in, in thinking about data, um, where it should reside um, and how it is handled. Um, and maybe also coming back to the, the very first question you had about, we can look at the entire Arctic, um, and the previous session had this geopolitical aspect um, of Russia not being accessible anymore. But for remote sensing, it is still accessible. Of course, we cannot sense everything, but it delivers certain information that we can use. Also for permafrost, for example, we can continue study coastal erosion, we can continue study lake change, things like land cover change, at very high resolutions, temporal and spatially. So it is helpful. It doesn't replace ground data and field data, but it will carry us at least for a couple of years into the future, understanding what is happening in, in this area. Thanks. Ashley, you want to add something? What is your challenge in accessing data or using data? Or do you have any, any wish <laughs> on, on, on data that you need and, and maybe could be provided by the private sector because it's not available? Or how to better link access cloud resources? Um, I think um, I can talk about how we, we worked with Planet to provide access to, to their high resolution data to Svalbard scientists and how that facilitated um, science that wasn't possible with uh, non-commercial satellite data. So things like counting walruses in, in Svalbard. Um, so you can find walrus uh, beaching sites in Copernicus data, but they appear as kind of an amorphous blob. Um, you know, you can say that this is a site where they come out of the water, or, um, but nothing more. Um, whereas groups using citizen science and, and AI have been able to use that data and um, to, to actually count individual animals. Uh, I mean, you can see in the data that's behind me now um, that the level of detail uh, that's available with this high resolution data. And one of the other groups that we've worked with, um, they're working on a surging glacier in Svalbard, so a glacier that undergoes a cyclic uh, change from kind of stagnation to really rapid flow and, and um, surface fracturing. And the high resolution available in this, in this sort of data allowed them to pick safe landing sites for a helicopter so they can go and do field work that's, um, again, only facilitated by, by um, having that high resolution. So essentially, we'd, yeah, I certainly would like to find more ways to get the high resolution data into the hands of the, um, into, of the, hands of the scientists, as I'm sure we all would. Thanks, and I think it's a message you like to hear. But I will open the floor now to the audience. There's plenty of people here still, which is great, probably waiting for the drink. But we are not there yet. If anybody has a question to any of our panelists, yes, please. One there in the front from Rasmus. Thank you very much, uh, Rasmus Bertels in the Arctic University of Norway. My question is, uh, I think in the, how to say, in the digital domain, we see a splitting up globally between uh, US-based uh, solutions and Chinese-based solutions. So my question is, in the space domain, do we have one, how to say, space data world, or do we see the same kind of splitting up between Western space data, uh, material, technology, etc., and uh, Russian, Chinese, perhaps wider BRICS? Thank you. Can anybody answer this question? I think maybe the scientist knows, are you using the same as your colleagues in China? Are you looking at the same data? See, That's probably a very good question, yeah. I mean, of course, um, open data sets from, from open missions, and Copernicus, Copernicus program, Landsat, are used by, by Chinese colleagues, certainly. Yeah. There are um, similar missions from China. Um, I don't know to what extent they are used by Western scientists and what the access is in these. So that's a, it's a good question. It's a PhD paper. I'm right not using there. No, but I, I think I, and I agree w with your observation. I mean, we, we see that upon working with, uh, w with US uh, market and government, uh, you know, it's difficult or even impossible to also be working with the Chinese missions. Um, I think historically, maybe so to mention, I mean, it was in the hand of the national government. So, I mean, clearly there's a certain heritage missions, which is clearly divided by US-based and Russian-based, and lately also uh, Chinese-based 
mission. So, but again, there's been always some sort of uh, also um, institution like CEOs or GEO who actually navigate and bring all these resources together. So I think it's quite complex environment and worth having another chat over later on. Indeed, I think we, we speak mainly about Western located space uh, infrastructure. Uh, while there's a lot also in the Eastern world, um, in GEO, we, in, in the West, we propagate this idea of open access and free and open access to all the data, which is the case for a lot of data in Copernicus, for all of the data and a lot of other data. But uh, for Russian and particular, but also for Chinese data, that's not yet, not yet in brackets the case. Thanks for the question. Any other question? No, then, oh, time is up anyway. So thanks. Please give our panel a big round of applause. <clears throat>